So it's my pleasure to welcome you for this webinar program organized by the Sri Lanka College of Obstetrician and Gynecologists. So I wish to welcome all our members, uh, fellows. Uh, I'm sure there are a lot of PG trainees and other doctors from various specialties. So I warmly welcome all of you for this webinar program. So today our speaker and the resource person is Dr. Yudi Pirakasiri. He doesn't need any introduction. He's a senior consultant uh, at Castle Street Hospital. And most importantly, he's the president of the SCCOG. And he's a past president of the Perinatal Society and the Honorary Treasurer of Suffolk. And in addition, he's the chairperson of uh, International uh, Representative Committee of RCOG in Sri Lanka. So today he's going to talk on handling the difficult cesarean section. I'm sure he's going to specially emphasize on, on morbidly abnormal present as well. You know, that is the, his specialty. He has a lot of experience and skills on this subject. So before I uh, invite Dr. Atasiri, uh, I'd like to thank our sponsors, uh, MicroHealth Cal uh, Private Limited. They took a lot of trouble to organize this event and let at the outset let me thank them for organizing this event and providing the sponsorship. Uh, that's all from here, Dr. Atasiri. You can start your presentation. Thanks. Uh, thank you, Mangala. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I think uh, these uh, series of webinars we have organized by the Sri Lankan College of Obstetrician Gynecologist. So I have to thank Dr. Mangala Dsanayak, the chairman of the research activities and uh, academic activities committee, organizing this and inviting me to give this lecture on handling the difficult. I think this lecture is uh, more relevant to our day-to-day -day practice because when we are handling the difficult cases, how to overcome them and how to plan and avoid the problems when we are having difficulties. So when we go through our morbidity, mortality meetings, maternal, neonatal, perinatal, most of these are due to the difficulties we have faced at deliveries of the babies. So in this topic, I selected the handling the difficult cesarean mostly as we all face difficulties during our practical career. So we see cesarean section is commonly the pursued as a simple and safe alternative to difficult vaginal birth. You know, cesareans are done to bypass the vaginal route, but at cesareans, still we face difficulties and end up in ending up with problems with the mother and the baby. So when we consider as cesareans, mostly we have two types of cesareans, the lower segment cesarean and the classical or the upper segment cesarean. Mostly commonly done cesareans are the lower segment cesareans. In cesarean, we have low segment with two types of scars made during deliveries, typical and atypical. What is a typical scar? You know, irrespective of the abdominal scar, when we open the lower segment of the uterus transversely, making it in the lower segment transversely, we call it a typical. Sometimes in difficulties, especially in delivering babies with obstructed labors, transverse lies, placental adhesiveness, or placental previa make the transverse incision extended, sometimes into J-shape, sometimes into T-shape, sometimes without surgical extension, tears down to the bladder, lateral walls, all these are atypical. Why it is important, this atypical and typical scars are the typical scars, in it is a single cesarean, in the second time can be, uh, can give vaginal deliveries, that is trial of labors. But when it's an atypical scar, there's a high risk of rupture, considering a labor with the typical atypical scar. The other one is the classical cesarean. So it is been rarely done, but now still we do for some indications. So when it is a difficult delivery, 
with ruptured membranes with the trans slide if you anticipate difficult delivery with the lower trans section classical is made that is the upper vertical incision over the body of the uterus sometimes the approach to the lower segment is difficult due to adhesions sometimes maybe due to the bladder sometimes fibroids sometimes placenta previa abnormally high vascular lower segment in case of perimortem cesarean section and the mother is dead to rapidly deliver the baby the classical cesarean section is been performed and very rarely we had to do upper segment vertical incisions to very premature babies in brief presentations as the lower segment is not formed for the safety of the delivery of the baby without much of trauma so when i consider these two types of cesareans we find difficulties at different different times with cesareans it's difficult abdominal access if you see the pictures shown down here you can see some of the scars are like vertical and very obese lower part is hidden and difficult abdominal access sometimes skin access and then access into the peritoneal cavity even at the time of baby deliveries we find difficulties after the delivery difficulties in delivering the placenta and controlling hemorrhage and difficulty in closing the uterine incision and achieving hemostasis and rarely we find difficulty in abdominal closure so when there is obese mother or sometimes herniated scar that we have opened and sometimes when there is sepsis with distended bowels and all these cases we find difficult abdominal causes so at different times difficult situations are found in cesareans i think most of us most of you those who are practicing obstetrics at any time may have seen this and encountered difficulties so many difficulties at cesarean there may be long list but torrential hemorrhage when you cut through the placenta previa we have seen some maternal deaths with torrential hemorrhage with hypolemic shock and sometimes coagulation problems when it is a difficult cesarean tearing the bladders damaging the bladders rarely extending in, uh, ex the incisions to the lateral walls tearing uterine arteries sometimes damaging the ureters i think in present obstetrics we don't see many unlike in the past when we see obstructed labor transferred from different past uh, long away in coming with impending rupture we found difficulties in those situations and these are nowadays not very common but still we see at different times so when you are anticipating a difficult cesarean i think the anticipation of the problem and prior planning and what kind of assessment risk assessment sometimes it could be a risk for surgery anesthesia sometimes medical problems sometimes coagulation problems all these should be assessed prior to surgery and have a plan sometimes may not be able to do the to along with the obstetrician sometimes we may need that the multidisciplinary teams depending on the severity of the problem so to minimize the difficulties at surgery and outcome how to have a better outcome risk assessment of difficult cesareans is important and if the surgeon or the obstetrician thinks that he is unable or he needs some more experience you know experience or skilled personnel i think better to have them with them at the time of surgery or better to send to a person or experience obstetrician for the care to minimize the problem so those all depends on how so how badly you are supported at your place may not be the skills sometimes the facilities sometimes blood transfusion sometimes are intensive care facilities sometimes are the multidisciplinary facilities so the importance of getting the risk assessed and deciding whether i or in your hospital or in your uh, theater whether this can be performed but that is that can be done only for planned surgeries but emergencies can happen at any time 
without any plans, you may have plan emergencies uh, always. So there are, you don't get all the supports if you are planning at that time, so we may have to do it alone. So when we do a cesarean by passing by general delivery, the, our goal is to have a traumatic delivery of the baby. But still we see injuries to the newborn, maybe trauma, trauma or maybe asphyxia or hypoxic injuries. So possible causes, deep or uncontrolled uterine incision lacerating the fetal parts we have seen, cutting the scalp that may not be very bad uh, damage, but sometimes face, cheek, and lacerating some of the skin parts of the baby. And inappropriate or inadequate incision made, made at the time of delivery, trapping the fetal parts at the time of delivery, especially in case of breech deliveries, in case of obstructed labor delivery in the deeply engaged head, or transverse lie, delivering with difficulty with the small incision. So they are also, you can do harm to the baby with trauma and sometimes haste or difficulty in fetal extraction also can lead to injuries to the newborn. When you consider these injuries, the common ones are the skin or the lacerations, but there can be fractures. We have seen fractures of the femur, fractures of the clavicle, fractures of the, the dislocation of the hips and different different kinds of bone injuries, peripheral nerve damages, spinal cord injuries rarely when you try to deal with difficult head, subdural hematomas resulting from direct trauma to the baby, and ischemic encephalopathy from hypoxic ischemic damage with delayed uh, delivery in some cases. So it's a common form of injury is the laceration to this uh, skin, and this is reported to occur between 0.74 to 3.12 of all cesareans. So this is uh, published sometimes back in 2002-2004. And the maternal outcomes. Difficult cesarean may cause birth uh, trauma to the mother. You have seen torrential hemorrhages, the broad ligament, cervix, vagina, bladder, ureters, and difficult hemostasis and disruption of the major uterine blood supply with trauma at delivery. So degree of damage and amount of blood loss can impact the duration of inpatient stay and the maternal recovery. Sometimes mothers lose organs like womb hysterectomies and sometimes they get damage to the bladder and, uh, or the ureters leaking urine, fistula formation and massive blood transfusion also can cause uh, in problems, ending up with sepsis, paralytic ileus, sometimes uh, multi-organ failures, all these maternal outcomes can happen with uh, cesareans if it is performed without care with difficult cesareans. So these are the risks uh, published by WHO, UNFPA, the moms, the mothers, post operative now pre operative problems are there the post intra operative problems are there post operative wound infections not only that complications of anesthesia blood clot formation dvts and the embolisms injuries to the organs and later on they can get infertility and placental complications in future pregnancies in uh, cesareans and the babies can have surgical cuts breathe, uh, and babies sometimes being delivered prematurely. Some of my slides are covered here. And uh, some of the problems with ischemia, ischemic encephalopathy, hypoxic damage, all these are possible. So difficulties, if you see this picture on the right hand side, the abdomen is very obese and there's a previous midline scar. And uh, you rarely see this kind of uh, patients in our country, but obesity is a problem. So in planning, so what kind of incision, whether you're going to do a rancor incision, vertical incision, and excising the incision. And sometimes when you get into the uterine, uh, the peritoneal cavity, you may see lots of additions between the abdominal wall and the uterus and getting difficulty in entering into the peritoneal cavity. And if, it is a difficult entry into the lower segment, better to 
avoid the lower segment uh, then damage in the bladder and the structures and get into the upper segment discomfort. So when you get abdominal incisions, I mean, unlike in the past, most of our uh, surgeries are done with uh, transversation, even myomectomies, uh, laparoscopies, and other kind of surgeries. So midline incisions are not very commonly seen. Sometimes midline incisions are also seen. So we make purposely the midline incision for emergency access in case of placenta previa bleeding and you need to go into the peritoneal cavity quickly to stop bleeding or in case of ectopic pregnancy so vertical accesses are done for emergency situations as well as for the convenience of delivering babies and the other commonly made suprapubic transverse incision panel steel incision is the commonly made sometimes you do extension of the access with cutting the muscles, maillard incision, if the access is needed more than what you have achieved with the uh, normal incision. And all these incisions can cause problems with hematomas, formation, sometimes burst abdomen, and it's very important to have meticulous hemostasis and to prevent subfacial hematomas and adequate hemostasis and cause of the rectus sheath and the subfacial tissues are very important to prevent wound complications and achieving hemostasis is very important. And difficult abdominal access with the abdominal incision in the previous scar adequately excise the surgical scar special care while entering the peritoneal cavity to avoid bladder and bowel injury. Better to open the peritoneum as high as possible in cases of previous scar because when we make the transverse scar, the bladder may be just there at the opening and you may cut damage. So have an empty bladder always with catheter and parietal peritoneum better to pick up as high as possible and lift it between two hemostats and stretch between them and make the uh, open with the scissor directed at the uterus. If you find a plane of loose connective tissue free with the finger or sob, cut the fibrous band. If dissecting the addition is very difficult or unusual, queue up and make it the upper segment section, uh, uh, incision. Now sometimes the bladder is badly adhered. So sharp dissection between the bladder and the uterus by retracting uterus backwards and attraction on the bladder upward may be necessary to get the lower part of the uterus in case of bladder additions. So that is also seen in some of our previous cesareans when you have one or two cesareans in the past in cesareans. So protect the bladder by emptying the bladder and adequate retraction and dissecting the bladder between the tissue planes without damaging it and protect the uterine vessels getting adequate maximum available space. So I said uh, in some ca difficult cases you have to make upper segment vertical incisions when it is previous multiple surgeries, densely adherent bladder or sometimes placental adhesive disorder in the lower part of the uterus with the morbidly adherent placenta, sometimes fibroids in the lower segment, or in case of cervical carcinoma, when you plan a hysterectomy with the cesarean, you may do upper segment cesarean. And I said in the previous slide, uh, in case of perimortem cesarean also, you make upper segment cesarean. So this is another problem that we common, and not very common, but now unlike in the past, we see more of these cases with abnormal placentation. So when you do the ultrasound scan for routine anomaly or scan around 20, 18 to 20 weeks, especially in case of previous scar uterus cesareans, when it is lower lying placenta or lying across those, always make suspicion, have a suspicion of adhesiveness of the placenta. So anteriorly low-lying, low place placenta, there's a higher risk of placental addition. And 
anticipate in these cases poorly formed lower segment and very vascular lower segment at surgery when you are doing cesareans. So if it is the placenta at the site when you open up, if possible, avoid the placenta by sweeping the membranes and between the placenta and the uterine and then rupture the membranes and assess the fetus. If it is still difficult inside the placenta and then rapid transplacental access and delivery is important to get the immediate access to the baby. Sometimes with the low line placenta, the difficulties may be finding with the delivery of the head when it is floating high head. So in the, when you go through the placenta, somebody should press the fundus of the uterus who is assisting you and get the head or the person part as much as low down and application of forceps may help to get the baby's head or rails delivery by breach is advised. Now, when you cut open, if it is a planned surgery, if you see this kind of a picture, so you know that is small vascular lower lying placenta with adhesive disorder. So uh, now most of the time these are diagnosed and planned surgery has been done. Sometimes this is seen at the time of delivery, especially in previous sections with lower lying placenta. So all of us should have some kind of plan for this kind of situations if you unexpected to find. But if it is planned surgery, the plan management can be done. So you have to, have, um, you have to face emergencies in cases when you see this kind of a situation. So the figure in 2018 February, they classified this abnormally adhesive placenta, so placental adhesive spectrum disorders into three grades. So this may be with the clinical diagnosis and histological confirmation. So grade one is just the abnormally adherent placenta, that is placenta accreta. I can't see my, uh, all these pictures in the screen with the side cover. So, so in a normal lower line placenta, it is just there, but there's a space between the placenta and the uterus. But in its accreta, it has <coughs> adhered to the uterine wall, but it can be separated without difficulty. One when it is placenta percreta or increta, it is gone through the myometrium. So in the cases of placenta accreta, graded as grade one, increta, grade two, and abnormally adherent placenta, which is percreta, that is surfacing, going through the myometrium, that is classified into grade three. So grade three also classified into three grades, grade three A. It is just going up to the uterine serosa. And when it has invaded the bladder, it is called grade B. And grade three is the bladder mucosa, and involvement of the other organs, like sometimes the placenta, the vessels, it's not the placenta here, the vessels adhere and go into the anterior abdominal wall and laterally lateral, lateral pelvic walls. And those are the ones with grade 3C and <clears throat> those are the difficult ones you find during surgery and massive torrential blood loss is anticipated. So this classification can be done with gray scale and color Doppler ultrasound, but in case if you have the suspicion, the other facilities like MRI may be needed, but rarely you need to do MRI to diagnose this kind of cases. So when you manage this adhesive placentas, you have to have a pre-operative preparation. So you find and confirm the diagnosis. So placental mapping is important. This is with ultrasound scan if you are experienced, you can do it alone or you may get the help of the <clears throat> radiologist. Once it is diagnosed, you have to have a care plan. So as I said, cases of placental adhesive disorder belong into grade 3C are the worst ones. So you may have to decide to deliver them little earlier than the matured 
37 weeks of gestation. So depending on the severity of assessment you see with the ultrasound scan, the gestational age of delivery has to be decided. And the patient should have good hemoglobin for the surgery. So target hemoglobin 11.8 with nutrition, good nutrition, blood transfusion, if necessary, or the ion therapy. And in case of premature deliveries, you may have to go corticosteroids and magnesium sulfate for babies less than 34, 32 weeks of gestation. Always get the informed written consent and have a checklist. That is a good uh, habit. And have adequate units of blood. You may not need six units of blood, but if it is a case of massive transfusion at, uh, anticipated, not only blood, blood and blood products should be said ready. As usual, ICU bed. Prior communication with the consultant and acid is very important rather than organizing and taking her to the theater without her or his awareness. And they should prepare and they should decide the mode of anesthesia and the supportive facilities. And prior inform the theater and get the equipment prepared and they may need longer time duration and better do it in the daytime with uh, adequate staff and the other equipment like rotom facilities, rapid transfusions, all those may be supportive for your surgery depending on the anticipated problems. So when you prepare this, so we in Akasa Street, my uh, unit, I prepare this checklist with all the uh, information above and we use the grayscale placental uh, scan to see placental lacuna, retroplacental clear zone, red line in early scans and use the color Doppler to see blood flows in the lacuna in the early stages and then flow in the uterine bladder interface to see how badly the when we use the late the the other features with the grayscale we assess the myometrial thinning placental lacunae loss of clear blood uh, sawn between the uterine wall and the um, placenta bladder wall interruptions placental bulging focal exophytic masses and we use the color doppler to see utero vesicle hyperscurity and the subplacental hyperscurity and the bridging vessels and the lacuna feeding vessels, all these are assessed prior to the surgery to see the severity and grade them accordingly. So if I show you some of these uh, ultrasound, these are normal uh, placental low-lying uh, ultrasound scan. You can see the placenta usually uniform, moderate echogenicity. And there's a clear space between the uterine wall and the placenta, the basal plate and the umbilical uh, cord incision and the display the distance between this is usually with about two to four centimeter thickness in third second to third trimesters but as in normal cases so you are better to have a half filled bladder go in the center as well as the lateral uh, planes usually you see hypoechoic area between the blood uh, uterine wall and the placenta in normal placentas but if you see no hypoechoic plane like in this case that means this placenta is not going to separate easily like in this other placenta at the time of delivery you may anticipate problems so that is one of the features that we assess in our ultrasound scan to diagnose the adhesiveness. And then the presence of, now in this placenta, normal placenta, it is more uniform placenta, but in this case, you can see more lacunae in the sense, some kind of lakes of blood in the placental structure. In this case, you can see more than two, three lakes, and sometimes more than that. The, so that is also part of the diagnosis we consider in our placental adhesive. And the, now if you see the bladder wall in this normal one, this is the bladder wall and then the uterine wall and there's hypoxic space. Sometimes you see interruption of the bladder wall here, unlike in the other one. So that is a sign of pleasant like uh, for, for adhesiveness and which is invading to the bladder wall. 
so if you see these interruptions in the bladder wall unlike in this smooth line that is also part of the uh, diagnostic uh, criteria so the other one thinning out of the myometrium so in the normal one you can see some kind of myometrium but here the bladder wall is there and there is no space between the bladder wall and the placenta myometrium is undetectable and here also thinning of the bladder wall and this is the worst one the placental bulges are seen unlike in the normal one in this uh, case so that is also a feature of placental adhesiveness and that is a worst case scenario like placental percreta and focal exopitic masses seen that is again the feature if you enlarge this picture you can see the, the bladder the, the uterine wall but uterine wall is very thin and there's a mass going into the bladder so unlike in this normal thinned out uh, clear zone so those are features of placental adhesiveness and when you use the color doppler uh, the right hand side you can see few vessels which are bubbling but in this case in this space you can see lots of vessels which are in different diameters and if you do the doppler blood flows they are with high velocity and that is a significant finding of hypervascularity in placental adhesive disorders so those are diagnostic features and when you go through the subplacental hypervascularity it is also seen very badly unlike in normal placenta and these are the bridging vessels in the color doppler imaging so the uterine the, the bladder the, the bladder uh, wall and these vessels are going across the may not be having myometrium but invading into the bladder wall so those are very bad features of placental adhesiveness and we anticipate more bleeding at the time of delivery if you happen to separate these bridges at the time of surgery so this is a 3d power doppler to see the placental vascularity the right hand side is a normal placenta with minimal vascularity but on the left hand side you can see very 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 bad vascularity which are the neo vessels on the surface dividing badly and uh, in different diameters all placenta is plate is vascular so those are the features we go through when we analyze this kind of placenta for mapping before the surgery to anticipate problems and to plan the surgery so once you diagnose the checklist we do the plan in the procedure sometimes this may be a hysterectomy going through the upper segment maybe a low segment transfer incision going through the placenta delivering the baby separating and taking out the placenta and repairing or maybe leaving the placenta maybe uh, different different procedures what you plan is planned and number of blood products on the blood transfusions availability of blood and blood products with the rotum availability and some of these patients may not be accepting blood some they had to do a patient uh, cesarean with the placenta previa with jehovah witness that patient did not accept blood so we had to be very careful and in a serious referral consent for hysterectomy icu bed preserved theater all these has to be properly done prior to the surgery so at the time of surgery you know everything is ready rather than you are finding difficulties at the time of surgery so the management of placental adhesive disorder i am not going to discuss in this lecture because that will be another lecture surgical management of uh, placental adhesive disorder but if you diagnose accreta during your surgery which was not diagnosed before don't panic know your limits if you are an experienced surgeon you can go ahead and do the surgery if not if your limits are if your surgical skills or the facilities are limited call for help may perform upper segment cesarean section and deliver the baby without uterotronics because if you give uterotronics the placenta may separate ligate the cord achieve vascular control and close leaving the placenta and transfer or wait for 
second time of surgery if your facilities are not adequate if you are happy to do the surgery with available facilities at that time it all depends on your supportive facilities and your surgical skill but avoid placental transection at that time so minimizing the blood loss now we know the problem here is the neo vessels they don't contract they don't retract and they are just bleeding they have no media so whatever the you trot uh, the angiogenic or the angio or whatever the uh, drugs you use to control hemorrhage may not act on them so you have to be ligated cauterized or compressed at the time of surgery to stop bleeding so all these measures should be done before you open in the lower segment or the upper segment if you are going through the placenta in the event of sudden separation and massive blood loss you may need to resort to hysterectomy in case if it is necessary so sometimes when you do this kind of surgery you get massive blood loss so always have a look at the monitor and your anesthetist should be informing you doctor dr ratnasiri now you are bleeding more and my, the patient's pressure is going down and she might go into collapse or shock very soon so you have to have a look at the blood pressure the C ecg monitoring pulse oximetry everything and if the blood pressure is dropping stop your surgery and control the blood loss with manual aortic compression that saves life if you leave to bleed and try to achieve hemostasis at your surgical site that may delay achieving hemostasis and may cause more blood loss trying to ligate it internal iliac while it is bleeding may be another hazardous thing of finding them and getting in quickly may not be very uh, advisable go to the aorta through your cut just above the bifurcation below the renal artery your thumb compress it now when the pressure is low down easily compressible and you can compress it on the spine and when it then advise you whoever the anesthetist you team to transfuse blood quickly and when the blood pressure is picked up your finger may feel that it is not easily be controlled and your pressure pulse will be back not near, uh, at least to near normal and then you are happy that she is not going to go into an arrest then once the blood pressure is controlled up you can start surgery so there is a gap for about 30 to 1 hour you can keep the aortic compression until you fill the tank not that until you finish the surgery to get more blood to the heart and the top part of the body within that half an hour you know the blood loss is very minimal from the bottom part of the surgical side and the legs won't die for this half an hour for your compression and that saves life i have seen most of these emergency situations that is not done in time and achieving hemostasis at the site of surgery which has delayed and she has lost most of its blood and trying to control when the blood loss is blood is not there most of the time in the circulation so that is a danger and better control and fill the heart and the, the vessels with blood so in that type case in the massive hemorrhage rapid transfusion is very helpful pumping 1 liter of blood in a minute with arterial line and that is giving life back in a patient who is collapsed or shocked and you know when more blood is lost it is not simply the blood also the coagulation is impaired so in that case the rotum the rotation of thromboelastomer helps you to tell what kind of factors are deficient whether it is fibrinogen whether it is platelet or both to replace them accordingly rather than giving just uh, blood transfusion so may need cryoprecipitate nowadays fibrinogen artificial fibrinogen is available in our theaters and sometimes it is platelet only so you can target what is so that is called uh, point of care transfusion that can be organized 
in a massive loss if you have the rotom facilities in a massive hemorrhage. So all these are planned when you are anticipating massive loss, especially in case of placental adhesive disorder grade three B C those kinds. So this is I have shown bilateral internal iliac drainage may not be very effective. See the blood supply to the uterus, the vaginal arteries are more dilated than the uterine middle pedicle, the diameter in low lying placentas and internal iliac ligation and the uterine artery ligation may not be very helpful. So endovascular occlusion with aortic clamping just above the bifurcation, as I said, with the finger with the low host settings, or if you can have ballooning with the interventional radiologist before the surgery that may occlude the aorta for time being and can be timely controlled or aortic clamps are made, which we have, don't have, this, just the, your assistance thumb or your thumb may help you, help to control the blood loss in a, uh, our settings. So many aortic compression. So you can see one hand is just above while the other hands are below so that the higher hand upper hand is controlling the aorta until and that gives you a clean dry area here for short duration until the aorta is released for your later surgery. Those are some of the important aspects in managing present blood disease disorders. I'm not going to give you the surgical management because that is another different lecture and we find obesity worldwide now I don't think that we see many, but it will be a problem in the future. So they have difficulties in handling anesthesia and opening, getting in, delivering baby and blood loss, closing, and the post-operative, the operative time may be greater than two hours in some cases, in these cases. And even after surgery, wound breakdowns, infections, endometritis, DVTs, and obese patients, sleep apnea, and all these problems are anticipated. So obesity is another big disaster which we have to face maybe in the near future. So the other problem we have seen in our morbid mortality, the difficult cesarean section in the second stage of labor with deeply engaged heads. So there are also you need surgical experience and quick delivery, mostly to delay the second stage further. There can be bad outcome for the baby and if it is delayed further. There can be impending ruptures of the uterus in some cases, especially in case of uh, past sections or multipara. So category one or quick cesarean may be necessary for in these cases. So the awareness of impending rupture, difficulty, everything should be anticipated. So experienced person should handle this situation. And some people use uterine relaxant anesthesia, tandem birth position, keeping the bladder empty is very important. And for this delivery, you can have two types of incision, low incision or higher incision. So there are different, different methods of deliveries described. And this engagement or manual disimpactment from impaction from below and then delivering the head through a low incision and making a negative pressure with insinuating the fingers below the person in part and getting it up or delivery by breach reverse breach delivery or uh, there are other uh, methods described and using the pillow below the head and lifting it up is described. And there's another method described higher incision at the level of fetal shoulders, patterned as described. So these methods had been used and you see in the second stage, the study with the first stage and uh, comparative study with the first and second stages with maternal and neonatal maternity with systematic review as shown, second stage seems to lead to higher maternal mobility admissions to ICUs, higher transfusion rates, neonatal death rates, increased admissions, neonatal units, and the SQB at higher 
low uh, high rates of low as gas costs at delivery were anticipated so second stage cesarean seems to result in significant increased morbidity for babies and mothers and neonates so important in second stage if you can do an instrumental delivery to avoid cesarean that is the best maybe with vacuum extraction or maybe different other types of forceps high forceps like keelands so in case of difficult cesarean in the second stage the push up from below and then elevating the head now going through a lower segment a slower scar and going to the fetal head scoop scooping up and elevate the head and then rotate and reduce and delivery this had been described and we all have practiced this and sometimes with this we find tears extending downwards or lateral and ending up with uh, more morbidity with the uterine incision damages and fetal pillow had been described this is not freely available in our setup a pillow is placed under the head and then inflating it getting the head up and then delivering that is like what we do by vaginal pushing up a pillow is placed under the head and inflating it and getting up to the plane and another method is making a high up incision not very low incision in the lower segment which is a smiling incision not extending down but curvy linear with extension of edges upwards and getting into the breech and delivering breech extraction which is called reverse breech extraction is described and atwa done there is a indian who has mentioned uh, you know described a method so the incision is made at the level of shoulders so originally shoulders first and then back for back anterior portion so both shoulders are delivered first anterior shoulder posterior shoulder and then the trunk is delivered by flexion and both legs are delivered and last the head is delivered so this has been described and this has um, improved the maternal and neonatal morbidity with uh, this method there is another one for posterior shoulders modified patterdan method and cochrane has studied all this and mentions techniques for assisting difficult delivery at cesarean section the in obstructed labors with the deeply impacted head reverse breech extraction appears to be significantly safer for mother and the baby than head push from below manual outcomes maternal outcomes demonstrating significant improvement in the reverse breech extraction group includes less endometritis decreased blood loss and decreased rates of bone extension and that is being more outcome better outcome for the babies as well so the cochrane review says the reverse breech extraction is the best method of delivery for deeply engaged head in obstructed labors and we use forceps for difficult delivery such cesarean and when the head is high up when the head has to go be delivered through a placenta in difficult access so in their those cases sagittal sutures should be placed transverse the operation baby's head should be turned to the transverse position and slight pandural pressure to push the head downwards towards the incision concavity of the pelvic curve towards the fetal occiput low blade is applied first followed by the anterior flex the fetal head with traction aided by pandural pressure crowning the fetal head in the abdominal incision and delivery with controlled extension is advised in those cases so we have seen sometimes when you apply the forceps it is been applied to the face and trauma to the soft tissues in the face sometimes trauma in the lips and the soft tissues i have seen have been seen so it has to be a gentle proper way of application for this and ventus had been used for application uh, delivery into subtraction so that is not commonly used in our setup i have seen in some of the places this has been done and when it's a transverse like plan in the cesarean delivery it's important if the after the opening of the uterus uh, the peritoneal cavity from 
external kephal equation if the membranes are intact it is easy to make it a longitudinal line so transverse line can be kind of the longitudinal but when the membranes are ruptured then when the hand is or something coming out through the incision all these are not possible and when it is a difficult access of the fetal bridge or the head a liberal j shaped incision in the lower segment is advised when it is with for a premature pre labor rupture of membranes because you know you may not be able to turn the baby or handle the baby especially in premature bridge deliveries and says avoid inverted t incisions and the liberal j shaped incision is a better incision for this kind of thing neglected transfers is a dangerous issue and possibly extension of incision exist and with these cases there can be sepsis if the membranes are ruptured for a long time breach delivery we have seen abdominal delivery is no different from vaginal delivery in breach extraction and pose many risks and we have seen fractures of the femurs fractures of the other bones different delivery so adequate incision and identify the type of bridge and making a adequate incision for access especially when the head is delivered through a tight opening in the uterine wall in the lower segment that also can cause damage to the head and sometimes injuries to the uh, spine so adequate incision is very important in this case avoid trapping of the after coming head by retracting uterus especially in premature breach the head trunk ratio there is disparity head is bigger and you can use smear white manure or else you can apply the forceps for after coming head like in a vaginal breach delivery if the head is not coming out easily especially in premature deliveries to prevent rather sudden decompression of the head and you have found difficulties in multiple pregnancies planning so sometimes placenta may be a problem and sometimes the fetal lie and the relationship of the two babies so always plan ahead and identify the placenta and the positions and the direction of the baby and they are also adequate abdominal and uterine incision so care taken to deliver floating head or breech orientation may be distorted mobilize adequate neonatal support in this case the clamp in the cord is quicker after the first baby to avoid retrograde bleeding from the placenta and there should be experienced neonatologist at hand and you have to make sure there is prophylaxis for postpartum hemorrhage make sure the bleeding is arrested after the delivery especially when it is more multiple twins triplets quadruplets the chances of postpartum hemorrhage due to atony is anticipated then adequate supportive measures should be there for those kind of uh, mothers at delivery and sometimes difficulty in uterine closures transitions could tear down to the blood age identification of the apex and repairing from bottom to top is important sometimes you may need to dissect the bladder down to get the bottom if the bladder damage is suspected injection of methylene blue to the bladder and i find the leak is important and repair it then and there is important and vaginal entry can occur if placing the incision too low or following a prolonged labor when the cervix is filled out so repair of vaginal incisions with proper hemostasis is very important after doing the top part because sometimes the bleeding can be from the bottom at the tears of the vaginal especially if you have attempted where instrumental deliveries before doing the cesarean section in second stage so for this hour, i think all what i can tell you is about this difficulties in cesarean and handling the experience and emphasis on training the resident doctors for interpartum second stage will increase their confidence and efficiency presence of experienced and ex skilled person at delivery in difficult cesareans minimize morbidity and mortality both maternal and neonatal planning the delivery power prior consultation with multidisciplinary team involved in those selected cases i mentioned 
and learning and increase the instrumental delivery rates in second stage cesarean and decision making and performance of second stage senior involvement is very important rather than junior first years registrar going and doing a, an experience a second stage cesarean and ending up with catastrophes so all that i have to tell in this lecture is this i think we should have more emphasis on training our resident doctors for these kind of cases to develop their confidence and efficiency thank you thank you mangala for giving me this opportunity to address you all so if you have any questions regarding this topic i can answer depending on the time limitations thank you mangal and all of you for listening on a sunday evening thank you dr sir i can't see any questions mm -hmm. uh, can you see whether there are any questions i can't see any questions so if you want you can ask uh, anything from me at the moment i am free to answer yeah we have few minutes more keep you minutes for the questions also for the taking more time yeah there's a question Uh, can i read this question uh, is performing reverse breech extraction for deeply impacted head how high do you place the incision right now for cesareans in those cases we use low scars and a little higher so it depends on how now it's the upper part of the lower segment not the upper segment actually upper part of the lower segment is cut curvy linear incision that is not a straight incision making it towards the round ligament so high up the edges and that has to be adequate exposure because you can make a bigger incision in the higher lower segment than in the lower lower segment and that will give you space to get your hands to the buttocks or the limbs and then maybe it's little bit you know turn down and take in the limbs first and then the trunk and the head last so the upper part of the lower segment now i said in push up you make a little lower part of the lower segment now that is easy to get the bottom part of the head in part patterns and reverse breech extraction usually at the level of the shoulders of the uh, baby the cochrane review has shown that is the best uh, out of all minimizing complications to the baby and the mother there's another question sir can you please explain how to handle retained placenta following delivery of second trimester fetus in a past section mother how to hand what is it the delivery of the placenta can you please explain how to handle retained placenta following delivery of a second trimester fetus in the past section mother right It's now probably asking after normal delivery yeah i think so vaginal delivery i think we had yeah. a similar case in uh, castle street after second trimester miscarriage so now before the delivery if you have mapped the placenta and assessed the varieties and the uh significance that is the how much additions or any features of additional is seen then it is difficult to deliver that vaginally because sometimes you if it is adhered to the scar that may traumatize this kind of cause internal hemorrhage there are several methods one is just allowing the placenta to de degenerate and come out but that may take time and sometimes secondary infection and secondary hemorrhage so 
if the placenta is retained and attached the scar, better not to attempt vaginally, then go upwards uh, abdominally and go through the scar and like in a low lying placenta with additions, you have to separate and take it out and repair the uterus. Or else, if you try to remove it manually, if it is an adhered uterus, you may cause trauma, bleeding, and may end up with uh, catastrophe. So it's safe to assess prior to delivery how badly it is attached, as well as with the fingers uh, if you are in the theatre. So having a uh, ultrasound scan in the theatre in cases will be more valuable to see how badly it is attached and where it is attached. So we had one of these similar cases in Casa State, second stage uh, baby delivered, placenta retained, and it was found to be adhesive to the scar, and later on, uh, uh, another you know, cut had to be gone through the scar, and ultimately it ended up with the hysterectomy, but if it is not badly attached, only the scar area is uh, badly come, uh, you know, involved, you can remove the placenta with the scar and repair it. We have done it uh, before. I mean, uh, De Soisa had to do one of them and that patient is pregnant again uh, after repairing the scar. Thank you, Dr. Arasiri. Uh, so shall we wind up? I think it's almost eight o'clock. Thank you for your comprehensive lecture on, on, on difficulties we can encounter during the cesarean section. And I wish to thank all our participants and uh, a big thank to our sponsors, uh, Micro Healthcare Private Limited, uh, for providing the sponsorship for this occasion. So thanks, thank you. We hope we'll do we hope to see you again in, in probably in two weeks' time. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mangala, me. Yeah, it's good. Uh, wait, wait, wait. There, I don't know. No? There were more than seventy-five. Oh, that's good, no? <laughs> yeah, there were about 75 years. Open <laughs> lecture in a lecture hall, we won't see sometimes. <laughs> yeah, yes. Uh, thanks, Ille. Yes, sir. All right, sir. My answer. Oh, yeah, all your support, yes. Labs, uh, thank you very much for giving us this opportunity, and I think we had a successful uh, webinar today. Yes, sir. Thanks for the help. Thanks. Okay. Right, Thank right, you. Right, right. Thank you. Thank you.